Listen, we're in the middle of a series called The Vision and Mission of Generations Church. And um, I just want to um, encourage you that if you have not heard the uh, first few parts of that, you can go. Uh, this is a shameless plug for our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to Generations Church of Lubbock and uh, like and subscribe, please. And then you can... Um, uh, watch or listen to the rest of these messages if you've missed any of them. But today, I want to talk about uh, the vision and mission of Generations Church as it relates to you as an individual. Um, we've been talking about corporate vision for the last several weeks, and I want to just impart a way uh, for you to get a personal vision for your life. I hope you know that God's plan includes you as an individual. It is not just something that you need to... I'm sorry if I look like I'm doing two things at once. It's because I am. Uh, my computer shut down on me. And uh, here we go. I got it to the spot I need it to. But every one of us should have a personal vision for our life. Not just a court, you're, you're, the company you worked for or have worked for or the church that you go to, surely you know that we've been talking about the corporate vision of Generations Church, but a lot of Christ followers are wondering, is there a place for me in the church, in the vision and mission of God's kingdom for what I should be doing with my gifts and my talents? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. And I want to share some of those principles with you today. And if you don't have one, I'm going to help you find the way that you can get that vision and mission for your life. So let's stand to our feet and look at Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to it. If you don't, you can most certainly look up at the screen. And we welcome our online audience today. Let's read aloud, loudly, and together Proverbs 29, 18 from what's on the screen up there. One, two, three. Read, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now that verse, uh, the King James, the old King James Version says where there's no vision. Vision and revelation are just the same thing, but the important part is this, that if you don't have a vision, you cast off restraint, you're out of control. You have nothing that's guiding you, nothing that's pulling you along with a purpose in your life. And so you must get a personal vision. It's not just a corporate thing. Let's read the next verse aloud and loudly together, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And he himself gave to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody say the ministry. God's called every one of us into the ministry. That's what this text says. It's the, the uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that equip the body of Christ. But if you're wondering, if you're online and you're wondering, God has called you to a place in the body of Christ to minister for the king and his kingdom. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have put your word into our hearts today, that your word is quicker and sharper and more powerful than any two-edged sword. Lord, that it divides asunder to the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. And Lord, my prayer today is that my thoughts and my words will be your thoughts and your words. And you'll help me communicate with clarity and authority that's not my own, that there is a place for every person in the body of Christ to affect effectively minister, whether it's in business, whether it's in the uh, just being a mother, Lord, whatever it is, you've given us a vision for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated today. We've been in this series, the title of this series has been The Vision, The Urge. Everybody say urge. Urge is an acrostic that stands for four words um, and one of them is urgency. I hope that you've been getting, been getting an urgency for what God's plan for our church is, for your life individually. Uh, I wrote a definition several years ago when I was a parent of three teenagers that, that has stuck with me for years. Urgency is the brevity of time 
plus the depravity of the world that's out there, and it pulls me out of my comfort zone. Now, when I was raising teenagers, I, and the world is a whole lot worse now than it was back then, and now I am praying double time for my grandkids. It gives me an urgency for the next generation because I only have a short time, the brevity of time. I felt like uh, I only had 18 years with my kids, and the world was a bad place, and it pulled me out of my comfort zone to be uh, in their face, so to speak, or to be uh, teaching, sharing, loving, caring. And, you know, urgency is that factor in your life that calls you to in action. You quit sitting still when you have urgency. And so I'm believing that as we've shared the vision and mission of Generations Church, and today as we talk about your personal vision, that it's giving you an urgency. The th second word is resources. That's just another way for saying money and provision. And resources, God, when there's a need, when there's an urgent need, God provides the resources. And resources will always lag behind your vision. Why is that? Well, if you had just had a big pile of money sitting over there to fix everything that you needed to, you'd never trust God. So your resources always, you're always pulling, you're always tugging on God's heart to meet the need of your resources. And your vision's got to be great. There's got to be greatness in you. There's got to be greatness that you're pointed toward, something that you want to do. And you're full of divine energy to get it done. And so when I think about the, that acrostic, I was flying home from Africa when the Lord put that in my heart, those four words spelling urge, and I wrote them down in my journal, and I came home because I knew I was going to be uh, talking about these uh, principles on vision. So I want to give you three quick definitions of vision. One of them we've been talking about every week. Of, it was written by George Barna. It's a mental image of a preferable future. Can we just do a little exercise right here? Just close your eyes for a minute. If you're online, just close your eyes. And I want you just to just imagine where you want your life to be in five years. That's a vision. That's a mental image of of a preferable future. Think about where you want your marriage to be. Think about where you want your business to be. Think about where you want your life to be. So now you can open your eyes and just, just picture that. You've got a vision in your heart that God's putting inside you. The second definition for vision is the one that um, I've been quoting Pastor Tim Timberlake. He is the pastor of Celebration Church in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And he wrote that a vision is a deep dissatisfaction with what is combined with a clear grasp of what could be. Now just think about that. You can apply that definition across the board in life. Business, marriage, children, church, ministry. If you're, if you're not happy with what is, but you have a clear picture of what could be, let's do something about it. Amen? Then the third one is a new one. This one is one that I wrote several years ago, and I've just been every week been adding some of these vision, these definitions so that you can see them. It's one that probably about 25 or 30 years, somewhere in there, I wrote this. It said, the overriding plan and purpose of God for your life that unfolds and progresses. In other words, your vision the vision of Generations Church, the vision in your marriage. And if you know, it's never static. It should always be growing and going. You, you accomplish one thing, there's a new thing in front of you. And you, you just never get to, I guess I want to say, you just never get to graduate and sit still. Because God's always doing something in us. God's always using something as a part of our lives. And, of course, we've been talking about it, and I want to say it one more time in front of you. The vision and mission of Generations Church is threefold. Touch the city, teach the nation, and train the world. And we are making those things happen in our city. One of the things that we just got through doing, and I want to say thank you to, it's in the bulletin, but I want to say thank you to everybody that helped work at the fair. This was our t-shirt we wore. We were all hope dealers as we worked in the fair. And that opportunity came up all of a sudden, just three weeks before the South Plains Fair. I hope we get to do it again next year. We'll be a little bit more prepared and get more volunteers and all of that, and, and, and it'll be a little bit easier on all of 
us, but the, the money that we're going to raise, don't know how much. People have already been asking, how much money do we make? I have no idea. We get a percentage of the gross, and uh, I'm sure in a, a week or a couple of weeks we'll find out, but it was a lot of fun. How many of you know we, we truly are better together, right? It's, it's a lot more fun to do stuff with people than by yourself, Right? Now, I love to go play golf, but I don't like to play golf by myself very much. It's fun to do it with somebody and to, and to build relationship and talk and, and have fun. So what I want to begin to talk about today is a three-step process. And, and I hardly ever uh, preach like this, where, like a formula. Uh, because, you know, once you put God in a box, he breaks that box. <laughs> right? <laughs> But this is some principles for getting a personal vision for your life that I've cultivated and learned and seen them operate in my personal life and in others as I teach them. But I want to call your, I didn't say this in the first service and I, I just feel, I, I skipped it in my notes. I don't know why, but the Lord's showing it to me right here. You know, God's a God of vision. Can you, can you say amen to that? Amen. And I'm just going to prove it to you. There's so many places I could pull from on that. But most of us, when we think of the story of Jonah in the Bible, we think about the big fish and Jonah being thrown out of the boat and the big fish eating him and him living for three days in the belly of a big fish. And then that fish spitting him up on the <clears throat> coast of Nineveh. Now, how many of you know that is not the point of the story? You know what the point of the story is? God had a vision for a city to come to know Jesus as their, or know God, that Jesus wouldn't, but we get the picture, right? God had a whole vision for a whole city to experience revival, and God was going to go to any lengths that he had to to get that vision accomplished. Now, is that not a better perspective on the book of Jonah? Than just thinking, well, the book of Jonah, you know, we tell our kids back in, in, in Gen Kids, well, you remember Jonah disobeyed and he threw him overboard and a big fish ate him. And that's like the point of the story. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that one man preached and the, a whole city experienced revival. God's vision and mission is people. People are the most important thing to God. Amen? And that's what we've got to get. That's what the heart of God is. That's, what, that's why we touch the city, teach the nation, train the world. It's all about what Jesus wants to do in the lives of people. Here's the first step in you getting a personal vision in your life. On the back of your bulletin, you can follow along with an outline. And the first word, the first principle is meditation. Everybody say meditation. Now, Eastern religion and the Eastern parts of the world, they tell you that meditation is, is that you empty your mind. You go sit out under a tree somewhere and you cross your legs and stick your hands out and go, um, uh, um, and you empty your mind. Biblical meditation is you fill your mind with God's Word. There's a total difference in the concepts. And the concept of filling your mind with God's Word comes from this verse of Scripture. In Joshua chapter 1, or one of the places, it says this. This is the transition between Moses leading the children of Israel and the transition to Joshua's leadership. And God speaks this word to Joshua. Do not let the book of the law, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Who wants to be successful? All of us. 
But there's only, the Bible says there's only one way to do that. You get the word of God on the inside of you. Then you experience prosperity and success. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may be able to prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. The will of God. You're not going to find the will of God by sitting under a tree and crossing your legs and going, Oh. And emptying your brain so that the devil can bring any wild thought there. You fill your mind with the word of God so that you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You have something to compare it to. And you know what? Listen, I, I, as, a, as a pastor for 45 years, I've had people come to me and say, I need to find out God's will. Well, here it is right here. God's will and God's word are the same thing. Well, I need, I need God's will for my marriage. Love your wife. Love your husband. Lay down your life one for another. It's just that simple. You say, no, you're over. Life is so much more complicated than that. Uh-uh. It's not. When you live your life based on these principles, life works out. Now, I'm going to tell you what. Nobody ever said it's easy. Because there is a real devil, and there is a real God, and the real devil, devil hates the real God, and the real devil opposes what God's doing. And when you get opposed, you probably should know you're on the right track. Because the devil only fights things that are on the right track. When you're not on the right track, the devil's like, get after it. He doesn't fight you. So when you're, if you're, you say, well, man, I'm tired of being, we sang these songs about this is how I fight my battles. Pastor Connie had us do all these prayer requests. Well, people are fighting. People are on track. We're going to fight. The imagery attached to the word meditate in the Old Testament, that word, I did a word study on it many years ago. And the word meditate, is the, the, the author that I read had the most amazing word picture for it. And it's very common. You'll, you're all going to recognize it. When a cow eats grass or grain or whatever it's going to eat, they say that a cow chews the cud, C-U-D. Well, what that means is that cow chews that up, chews, 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 and it gets into a big wad and the cow swallows it. And then in a few moments, the cow regurgitates that right back into its mouth, chews it some more. I know, Lori, that's a bad word picture, but it's true. Lori's back there going, oh, that's gross. But that's what happens. That cow, swallow, spits it back up, and does it several times. Listen, that's the biblical method of meditation. You, you say, well, Pastor, I've heard that story from you. I've heard that scripture from you. I, I, I heard that from my, my pastor when I got saved. Listen, you should never get tired of God's word. You should be chewing and chewing and chewing. I learn things. I learn new things about the scripture and about the character and the nature of God all the time because you chew, 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 swallow, regurgitate. Amen? And you know there is a connection between your success and your meditation of God's Word. And this text proves it. There's a connection to how much. Look at this, and I don't, I don't think I put it in uh, the PowerPoint. Maybe I did. I can't remember. Um, I did not. Listen to this. Psalms 1. The jo oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord. Listen to this. Meditating, it's the same Hebrew word, Psalm 1, verse 2, says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Listen to the verse 3. They, the ones meditating... On God's word, they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. There is a connection to your meditation on God's word and your success. There's a, you know, I, I, I don't know 
who I'm speaking to right now, but I'm just there's a your depression is connected to your diet on the word of God. Your anger is connected to your diet on the word of God. Because when you chew the cud, when you meditate on God's word, you force out the negativity and bring in the principles of God's word. Chew the cud. You'll probably never forget that now. But meditate on God's word. Now, when you do that, here's what happens. Here's the next step in getting a personal vision is the word revelation. Everybody say revelation. Now, I'm not talking about some ooh-ah, out-of-the-body, paranormal, bodily experience. I'm talking about just the natural course of God giving you ideas. My wife down here on the front row had an idea about a year and a half ago to write a book. You say, oh my, and she's like, she's arguing with God. I don't know, who am I? Why should I write a book? And the name of her book is The Party Is Here. I believe that it is a God idea. It wasn't a good idea. It was a God idea. It was not an easy thing for her, all the edits, all the process that she's gone through. I've watched, it's, it's, it's been almost like watching her give birth to one of my children. But it's her book. And by the way, you can go buy it on Amazon now. The party is here. I, don't, I, I am part Baptist. I preach, pray, and advertise. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a dumb joke. I'm sorry. But you know what? This process, there was, I guarantee you, if, if, if you were to sit down and talk with her about this process, there was meditation. There was a God idea that got downloaded into her, how this book was going to come together, all the parts, all the pieces, and now it's, it's a reality. It, there was a revelation. Back in the mid-1980s, I was pastoring. We pioneered a church in 1984, the year uh, Lance was born. Uh, my youngest son, I always remember that month, and uh, we... During the time of pioneering that church, I I don't know. I guess I was looking for something to do. I don't know. But I was praying one day, and God said, meditation. I was regurgitating God's word. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to write Coach Gerald Myers at Texas Tech, the head basketball coach for Texas Tech, and ask him if you can come be the chaplain for the Texas Tech basketball team. And you know, now, I, I knew Jared, Coach Myers. I'd gone to all his basketball camps. He has a daughter that's Connie's age and, and, and went to high school with her and, and knew the family. I was always a fan and had always, you know, just always known all about that part. But, you know, I didn't think he cared a flip about a preacher pastoring a brand new church that was a year old. So I, I sent the letter. I did it. I wrote, wrote this nice one-page letter, sent it to his office. About two or three weeks later, I get a phone call from his secretary, who was the lady that checked me in at all those basketball camps. Says, hey, Ed, Coach Myers wants to see you. When can you come in? And I'm like, wow. So I, I, I said, just a minute. Let me check my calendar. <laughs> I got back on the phone and said, hey, I can come. Is this a good time? And she said, yeah. I went in. Coach Myers, great big old office. And, you know, typical coach, you know, he wasn't no small talk. He wasn't shake your hand. How you doing, Ed? How's the family? He said, what's your idea of a basketball chaplain for the team? And I told him, my idea is just to come and be available with the guys. Just speak to them at the pregame meal. I said, I guess y'all have a pregame meal. And, and give me 15, 20 minutes to encourage them, challenge them from, a, from a, 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 not preach to them, but just challenge them from a biblical perspective. Be, ava- be available at practices. Uh, be around where guys can come talk to me and, and all of that kind of stuff. And Coach Myers, he looked at me and he said, well, I talked to Coach Evans about this idea and he said, we need to do it. Now, Here's the key ingredient to this story. Rob Evans was Gerald Meyer's assistant coach. Well, Rob Evans is from Hobbs, New Mexico. He played for and coached under Ralph Tasker, who's won 20-something state championships in the state of New Mexico. And Rob Evans' dad is a Pentecostal preacher in Hobbs, New Mexico. And Rob serves Jesus, and Rob's told Coach Myers, we need this. 
And so they opened up this huge door to me the last three years that Coach Myers was the coach at Texas Tech. I got to, got to be a part of that team and a part of that environment. How did that happen? Meditation, revelation, got a download from God. And now then the, the, the thing that you've got to do is you've got to act on that. I want you to look with me at, there's a scripture that we've talked about already, but I want you to see it. It's in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. This is the, the, the re, pray, write, re, run. Pray, write, run. Everybody say it with me. Pray, write, run. This was the last message I preached. But I want you to look at this one phrase in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. Revelation. And then he said, write and run. You've got to get a, you've got to get a download from heaven. You've got to position yourself through meditation. You're going to read. You're going to. Chew the cud, and you've got to get God's word on the inside of you, and then your way will be prosperous. Then you will have success. You're going to meditate on the Lord. Then you're going to be like a, 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 a oak tree planted by the rivers. Amen? But you've got to position yourself in a place to receive the revelation. And Habakkuk wrote about that years and years ago. Here's this word revelation. Look at Exodus chapter 3. Here's another biblical example. We all know the story of Moses. It says this, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Miracle number one. He's seeing an angel. Appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. It didn't consume. Now, what kind of, what kind of bush is in the desert? Was it a cactus? Was it a tumbleweed? It was on fire. It wasn't being consumed. And not only that, there was a voice coming out of it. And I've always thought this was funny. So Moses thought... I will go over and see this strange sight. We would all stop and go see this sight, wouldn't we? Why the bush does not burn up. Now, what we know is out of that burning bush, God spoke to Moses, gave him a call of God, gave him a revelation of what he's supposed to do next. And that's so important in your, your, your life and my life. We, met, we find through meditation, and that's not emptying your mind, it's filling your mind with God's Word, we get a revelation from God on what our next steps are. When, um, during that same time period that I was talking about, after about nine and a half years of pastoring that church, we felt the direction of the Lord to merge that church with Church on the Rock out here on Slide Road. And we got out there and we, we did that, and Connie and I later became the youth pastors. And one of the biggest frustrations that we experienced early on, we, I was 35, Connie was 33 at that time, and one of our frustrations was we, we had been out of, quote, out of youth ministry for a while, was seeing how the issue of teenage sexuality was plaguing our, our young people. So I decided to do something that had never been done before. I decided that I was going, that, and I, this process, this meditation revelation is how this happened. And it's leading to the third step that I'm going to tell you in just a moment. I got this idea that I'm going to do a love, sex, and dating seminar Friday night and all day Saturday. I'm going to require that if the, one of the students comes, one or both of your parents has to come. And I'm going to charge them money for it. And the negativity that's Spurred up, all you're going to charge for this. You're going to you're going to make before a student can come. You're going to make the parents come too. I said, yeah, I'm tired of teaching this stuff, and it never gets home to the parents. I wanted to create an atmosphere of accountability, and everybody said, well, your your crowd's not going to be very good, and that's not going to work that way. Well. God, I believe God specifically gave me that plan. So I just kept on going. Well, we had 42 kids. We had 60-something parents that went through the whole thing. And here's what's crazy. 
Not crazy. It's the way God operates. Out of that, I got an opportunity 26 years later after it was all said and done. I was teaching those principles in public schools all over the world to the tune of 6 million teenagers. And that doesn't count all the churches, conferences, and camps I spoke in. That's just public school. You say, are you bragging? No, I'm not that smart. I'm telling you that here's the third step. Implementation. When you get, when you meditation, revelation, and you get that idea, and you act on your God idea, God breathes on that idea, and things happen that you have no clue could ever happen. There's no telling what's going to happen with Connie's book. There's no, telling, there's no telling what stage, what opportunity, what situation God's going to put her in, all because of her obedience. I obeyed God, and God put me in front of people that, that you, you know what, one of the, I've got a picture in my office that my son Lance made for me, and I'm preaching. I got my finger out like this, and he superimposed that picture on top of an audience in Mongolia where 5,000 teenagers were listening to me teach about sexual purity from public schools. That is amazing. Who gets that kind of opportunity? I'm telling you right now, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. God, and, and it's unfolding and it's progressing. It's not static. But you've got to implement, you've got to act on what God shows you. And sure enough, all that negativity about the love, sex, and dating conference and all that stuff, well, every, bit of, every bit of what I did for 26 years, and I could go, I could tell story after story after story of the opportunities that God gave me. It was all because of one step of obedience. And then walking through door after door after door. And you know what? Implementation. I've got some, some points of wisdom up there for you. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't, don't get upset and say, well, if it, doesn't just, if it doesn't just blow up overnight, I'm quitting. That's the way our culture is. Our culture is full of instant gratification. And then if it doesn't just blow up and, and explode, well, I must have missed God. Listen to me, folks. I do not, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again because I think you need to hear it again. I do not subscribe to the vision of the month club. God is not schizophrenic. He's not changing a new idea every 60 days because it doesn't work in 60 days. Let me tell you what, next month, this church, November 6th of next month, this church will be 16 years old. I ain't quitting. You say, well, well, we're not doing anything significant yet. Well, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear any of that. We're going to obey God, and when the time comes, good stuff is going to happen. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Good stuff is already happening. I'm not nervous about that. It's just that you don't despise when it's, you say, well, where'd you get that saying? Well, I got it right out of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4. He says, despise not the day of small beginnings. And then the second bit of wisdom I want to share with you on implementation is start where you're at with what you have and do what you can. Well, where'd you get that, pastor? Well, I got it right out of the Bible. There's a guy named David that killed a guy named Goliath because he started with what he had, five smooth stones. He did what he could where he was at, and God did the rest. Amen? That's exactly what David did. He didn't, I mean, he didn't wait for, some, he didn't wait for God to write it in the sky. David, go do this. He didn't wait for some personal prophecy to come. He did what he could, where he was at, with what he had. And that's what you and I do. Let me just, and here's the third piece of advice up there. And this is just practical stuff, although it's in the Bible. Your best effort and my best effort is mediocre at best. 
I'm telling you what, my best sermon, I, you know, sometimes I think I've got the most creative, the most impactful way of presenting something that's, that's super, that's 2,000 years old. And you know what? It doesn't make any difference how creative I get. It doesn't make any difference how cool my PowerPoint is. It doesn't make any difference how loud or how quiet I get or how excited I get. I'm going to tell you something. If God doesn't breathe on it, nothing's going to happen. Nothing. Zero. My best sermon idea is mediocre at best. We've got to have the breath and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit on what we're doing. So stop wanting what you can do and start wanting what you cannot do that only God can do. That only God, when he breathes on it, when he does it, when, he, when, when his Holy Spirit speaks to hearts and lives. I mean, I, listen, the, the whole love, sex, and purity thing, the whole thing in public schools, I am not that smart. I never conceived of that in my brain. That's how big God is. I'm reminded of standing up here talking to you of a, opportunity I had in Corpus Christi, Texas. This was a, a lectureship series that was put on by a university down there. And they asked me to come speak and they wanted to talk about my subject, teenagers and teenage pregnancy and teenage sexuality. And they asked me to speak five times. I did three keynote addresses from the stage and I did two workshops, about 1,500 people there. And I'll never, ever, ever forget what happened. In the green room, or what, what we call a green room, it's the waiting room where all the speakers and all the hosts and all the uppity-ups that put on the conference where they were introducing me around and that I was the keynote speaker and blah, blah, blah. Everybody, they were talking like it. I mean, and I might be exaggerating a little bit, but the thing that they were communicating was that everybody paid $200 a person to come hear me speak. Everybody had either initials in front of their name or after their name, like DR or PhD. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Todd, I'm scared to death. I got my little half associate's degree from Christ of the Nations, and I'm standing up there going to speak to all these people. And they paid $200 a pop. I said, can y'all direct me to the bathroom? <laughs> I, I'm not lying, y'all. I went to the bathroom, and I stood in the bathroom, and I closed that door, and I prayed in the Spirit as intensely, as passionately as I knew how. I said, Lord, I don't know how I got into this room with these people. I don't know how I got to this spot, but if you don't help me, I am in real trouble. God help me. And you know what the coolest thing was? The three keynote addresses and the two workshops, after every single one of them, I got to pray with individual after individual after individual. I couldn't talk about God from the stage, but when people started asking me questions, I was able to share my faith and where I was coming from. And if I remember, I don't know what the number is, but I can tell you this, heaven, heaven will know, God opened up the door for me to lead multiple people to faith in Christ or to rededicate themselves to Christ that weekend. Listen, I am not that smart. You've got to implement the God idea, not the good idea. You've got to be willing to meditate, put yourself in a position to receive something. You've you, you got to do something you've never done to get something you've never had before. And then you take that revelation and you act on it, and God begins to use you at the grocery store, at Walmart. He uses you with old friends you haven't seen for 30 years. I was listening to my friend Todd James at the 
lemonade stand this weekend. We were working side by side, and some old boy from his past comes up, sees his shirt. We're hope dealers. And the guy goes, well, you dealt a bunch of that other stuff. Out, right out of Todd's past. She's throwing it right up in his face. I'm like, I wanted to pop that guy. I wanted to hit him right in the mouth. Well, Todd did great. Todd just laughed it off, talked about, no, we're dealing some hope. We're helping people. I mean, he, I, can't, I can't say it, but Todd was ready with an answer. Does Todd have a past? Heck yeah, so do I. So do you. But you know what? We, God wants to give us an answer of how to get hope to the lost. And he wants to use your personality and your gift and your talent to do it. I witnessed Todd's talent. I witnessed. I mean, he could have got offended. He could have said, well, you need to shut up. There's my preacher standing here. I, I guarantee you it wasn't anything I had never heard before with Todd. But the, <laughs> the deal is Todd was instant in season and instant out. He was ready. So cool. But see, there's... There, Yes, our corporate vision is touch the city, teach the nation, train the world. But here's the key. As the worship team comes back, I want to close today with, I want you to take walk out with this. The blank you need to fill in on your back of your bulletin is this. Endurance is the key to obtaining the promise, vision, plans, and purpose of God in your life. If you're not willing to stick to it, It'll never happen. Stick to your marriage. Stick to your business. Stick to the vision God put in your life. Hebrews 10, 36 says this. You have need of endurance for that after you've done the will of God, you obtain the promise. You don't get the promise until you're doing the will of God. You don't get the promise until you take steps of obedience and you hang in there. Do you know what I read this week? In, in, in preparation for, for my message today, I was doing some research on the word endurance. And the word endurance and the, the biblical concept is not, you know, endurance. We think, oh, I'm barely making it. I just got to go through this. I just got to do the last night of the South Plains Fair. I got to endure. Well, that's it. You endure, but you're not stagnant. You're, you're, you've got a burden. You're going forward with the burden. That's what endurance is. Endurance in your sitting down in this horrible mess. You keep going. That's why, that's why Generations Church is 16 years old. That's why I, I'm going to show you a video in just a minute. They're going to get it ready. I'm going to show you a video of where I preached in Lockhart, Illinois. It's a suburb of Chicago. It was two weeks ago. Pastor Brian Bauer, you're going to see his picture and you're going to hear his voice. And I want to I want to tell you something when you hear this when you watch this little bitty short video I want to tell you the story of Thrive Church. I got a chance on Saturday night to he pulled all their leaders together in his home and I got a chance to encourage and inspire and 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 answer questions and a few questions and and we talked about this very subject. We talked about vision. And then I got to preach on Sunday morning and it was such an honor to get to do this. And Pastor Brian, in front of his whole church, and I didn't even know this, brought me to tears. He said, Pastor Ed is the whole reason I am in full-time ministry today. I didn't even know that until that day. But you're going to see their church is six years old. And you're going to see where they're having church. They're still mobile. They load up in a trailer every Sunday. But get this. We're talking about endurance being the key to success. This six-year-old church in six years has moved 17 times because people have pushed them out of their location. Now, come on, I, I'm, not, I'm not a mathematician, but, but that's almost three times a year, but then you have to stop and recalculate that the location you're about to see in this video, they've been there a year and a half. Yet they moved 17 times. And I preached to probably 60, 70 people. 
I'm guessing. I don't know. But watch this video. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Thrive Church. Come on All out. Right. This is my friend, Brian Bauer. He's planting Thrive Church here in greater Chicago, specifically Lockhart. And this is a gymnasium that they tear down and set up each and every week with all the draping and everything. They've been doing this for six years. This is amazing, amazing. Look at this place that you can get your picture taken with Thrive Church. And look at all of this equipment that they set up and tear down cameras, lighting. This is amazing. Pray for this church. As you can see, it's a pretty elaborate setup. All those curtains and everything, they break it all down and put it in a trailer. Every single week, and they've moved 17 times. The picture of endurance. The Olympic athlete, as I started to say a while ago, the typical Olympic athlete trains four hours a day, 310 hours, I mean 310 days a year, for six, four to six years preparing for the Olympics. Endurance. Endurance is the key to your vision coming to pass. Bow your head and pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to speak these words to an online audience, to an in-the-building audience. Lord, my prayer is just super simple. That you will download, you will help people meditate. Through meditation and revelation, they will get that God idea. And then, God, you will inspire them to obedience through implementation. And, God, that we will be world changers. Lord, you changed the world with 12 guys that you spent three and a half years with. And then you sent them out to be world changers. Lord, my prayer is that the people that are within the sound of my voice today, either digitally or in the building, Lord, will hear your voice. And, Lord, they will take steps of obedience. I want to pray for you today. I'm not going to call you to the front or put a mic in your face. But if you've heard something today that you know is a point of obedience on your part, that you've got to step out. You've got to, you've got to do something. You've got to change. You've got to, you've got to figure out how to fit meditation, revelation, and implementation into your personal vision. That you know that God has a purpose for your life. I want you just to slip up your hand right now. Just slip it up online. Just... You can just tell us in the feed, say, I'm raising my hand. Father, I pray for everybody's hand that is up right now. I just thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is strong enough, powerful enough, Lord, to go with them and, Lord, to, to guide them. Lord, not through an emptying of their mind, but through a filling of their mind through the meditation on God's Word. And, Lord, that you will get that download into their heart through revelation. And, Lord, they will act on it. As James 4.17 says, Though t- when you know to do right and you don't do it, to him it is sin. God, don't let us sin through disobedience. Lord, when you give us God ideas, we must obey. In the name of Jesus, amen.